Oftentimes when I see a truck driver do something wrong, my instinct is not to go, you know, oh, what a bad criminal he is. My instinct is to look and say, well, you know, what did the motor carrier do to help him succeed? Even with the so-called bad eggs in some of these big truck crashes, they'll even admit, man, oh man, if someone just taught me the right thing to do, I would have done it. I just don't know. I'm pleased to announce that we have Adam Grill as our guest. Adam grew up in the uh, trucking industry. has been driving trucks probably even before he had a CDL. He got his CDL back in 2005. He has endorsements for buses and hazardous materials, tankers, double trailers, you name it. He's the president of Legacy Corporation. He's the director of motor carrier operations for the Atlantic Pacific Resource Group. He teaches other folks how to drive trucks and semis. Uh, but on top of all that, he also does forensic work for both plaintiff and defense lawyers. I'm attorney Dave Craig, managing partner and one of the founders of the law firm of Craig, Kelly & Follis. I've represented people who have been seriously injured or who have had a family member killed in a semi or other big truck wreck for over 30 years. Following the wreck, their lives are chaos. Often they don't even know enough about the process to ask the right questions. It is my goal to empower you by providing you with the information you need to protect yourself and your family. In each and every episode, I will interview top experts and professionals that are involved in truck wreck cases. This is After the Crash. Adam, welcome to the, the podcast. Hi, right, thanks, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Great, great honor and... Uh... That's, I almost, I sound like a Game of Thrones character. You start giving me all those titles and stuff. I don't know if I'm royalty or what the deal is. <laughs> well, talk a little bit about this, how you got, I mean, I know it's a family. You've been, it's a family kind of business. Why don't you talk a little bit just about your background, how you got into trucking? Yeah, it's a, our business now is a family business, but uh, my journey into it is also certainly very family oriented. I have a lot, I have family members that are not necessarily involved in this business, but are, are still in the trucking industry too. I mean, uh, my, my mom and dad met each other as over the road truck drivers and they drove over the road together for a long time. Uh, and, and so my mom's always been a truck driver as well. Uh, and ever since I was uh, a young baby, I was fortunate enough to also have now a stepmother. So ever since I was small, I've, I've, uh, I tell people I have two moms and so both of my moms have been in the trucking industry. Uh, my biological mother is a truck driver and then, you know, doing things like dump truck work and stuff, which you don't see a lot of females doing. And then eventually now at the latter part of her career working into as a school bus driver, which is a very noble profession in my mind. And one of my sisters is also a school bus driver. Uh, my brother is one of the most incredible drivers I've ever seen works heavy equipment like i mean it's he, he's a picasso with heavy equipment it's he's truly an artist and uh my my grandfather owned a large mining co construction company and so i think that's how my dad kind of got started early on and so it's it's just something that uh our family's always been around and been exposed to and uh you know my my stepmother has, has always been an administrator she's run schools run tr other trucking companies uh, to an extreme level of success. And so her, her and my father make a heck of a team for that. And so it was, was kind of natural. I mean, you know, I, I kind of, I'm kind of joking, but I'm kind of not when I tell people I started to learn to drive a truck when I was about five years old, <laughs> I, I do have some very vivid memories of, you know, things, things might've been a little, uh, looser back then. So, but I do have very vivid memories as a kid of, of doing things like, going over the road with my dad and, and sitting in his lap and kind of holding the steering wheel while we're driving. And uh, I have very vivid memories of sitting in the back of uh, trailers at truck stops and talking to other truck drivers as a little kid with my dad and socializing and really experiencing all of that. And I, you know, I, e even, even well before I had my license, yeah, I was, I was working, you know, after school jobs, even in middle school, uh, so, or, you know, early teen years and, and younger years, uh, I would work at their truck driving school, um, moving trucks around, coupling and uncoupling trucks and washing trucks. And so it's, I've, I've always been exposed to it. So it's kind of in your blood. It's in my blood. Yeah. It goes back quite a ways. Even when, like I said, with my grandparents too, a lot of mining and construction work. Yeah. 
So, so kind of tell us what you're doing nowadays. I mean, so bring us up to speed on what your roles are and, and, and how I know you're involved in, in a variety of different types of things. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we still, we're, so we're, we're still in the trucking industry and we do wear a lot of hats. You know, we, we have a trucking company. Uh, so we're a motor carrier. We still have a, a fleet of truck drivers that drive over the road and drive at all, all 48 contiguous States. And, um, we haul a lot, primarily like flatbed and step deck work. Uh, so not van trailers, but uh, usually like construction materials and, and equipment. And now we've branched into oversized loads as well. So our our truck drivers haul things like when you when you see on the road, the really 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 big stuff that's taken up a lot of lanes and has the you know yellow flashing lights and the big black and yellow signs that say oversized load. That's kind of what we got into now. Um, but we're also a broker, so we'll broker loads. We have a truck driver training school. Um, in fact, we were most, most, this isn't an official statistic, but most likely based on how things kind of unfolded, I think we were probably the first school in the nation to become certified this year when they're, you know, this, this may, this may come as a scary thought to a lot of your viewers, but there was no requirement to receive training or go to school to become a truck driver prior to this year. So, um, but as of this year, there is official regulations that say you have to go to a, a, an official truck driving school. And I think we were the first one in the nation to become official, you know, with the, with the federal government. So we have our truck driver training ent entity, and then we still do consulting work too. So we, we consult for truck crashes and uh, we consult in, in other variety of ways too. We work with the U S government on several projects related to trucking regulations and things like that. And we've consulted with other motor carriers. They may hire us to come in and perform safety audits or provide speeches or education and training to their drivers, that sort of thing. Well, and I know certainly I think one of your goals is in, the, in your company is to, 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 you know, to, to raise up the, the level of professional truck drivers, provide the highest level of training uh, to better, uh, you know, to make sure that the drivers are fully equipped to be able to handle any and anything and everything that they may encounter on the roadway. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. I think our, in, in everything we do, our real mission here is, is a lot of uh, public awareness and increasing the roads so that they're safer for everybody. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a new dad myself. I got a two and a half year old baby and I got a five month old baby. And it's uh, it's amazing how that really helps change your views too. I start to look at the roads like, man, oh man, I really, I, I hope everyone that's driving around me truck or not is, is paying attention and aware to the fact that I got precious cargo on board. And so our, that's, that's really our mentality with everything we do. How do we make our drivers safer? How do we make others safer? How do we make others aware of the good truck drivers that are out there and, and that sort of thing? I think sometimes, sometimes I, it's, it's, uh, it's not unusual in our line of work, David, for, for the, the other side to sometimes want to paint me to be a bad guy or somebody who's out to just hate on truck drivers or, or hate on the industry. And it honestly it can be farther for the, from the truth. You know, my, my default position as a trucker myself too, my default position is to defend the industry. Um, but, and I, I think even those in the industry would agree with me that we, we also need to defend it from within, you know, against those that aren't doing things the right way. And I think that's true. I mean, I, <clears throat> and I, obviously attorney that represents the victims of catastrophic semi truck or tractor trailer wrecks or other big, big, uh, big trucks or rigs. And, and so some people time, sometimes people think, or they'll say things to me derogatory towards truckers. And, and that offends me, but they think they're not offending me because that's what I do. And I said, no, I mean, the majority of truck drivers, in my personal opinion, are good, professional, caring, people who are trying to do their job and get home to their families safely and not endanger anybody else's lives. Um, it's the select few that there are a few trucking companies. There are a few truck drivers that are, thank God, are in the minority that are don't care about safety and put profits ahead of safety. Um, but my experience has been, and I represent a lot of truckers who get hit by other truckers, but my experience is that that you know, thank God for truckers because they keep our country rolling and they keep our country operating. 
And most of them are really good people. Yeah, I, I agree. I say that all the time. Same thing that most of us are, are just salt of the earth people. We're just trying to make a living. And, and I, I don't, I, I truly, you know, maybe I just uh, have too much of a naive heart, but I truly believe that the majority of us, like we're not out here trying to hurt people or try to injure people. We don't want to break the law. And so I think it's a very, very, like you said, a small minority of people where that's the case. And, and I put a lot of pressure too on the motor carrier. I, I feel a lot of pressure myself. Uh, and I, you know, like I said, like same thing, being a new father, I put, a, you know, if, if my child does something wrong, I put a lot of pressure on myself in, in that role because it's my responsibility to teach and guide them to make the right choices. So oftentimes when I see a truck driver do something wrong, my instinct is not to go, you know, oh, what a bad criminal he is. My instinct is to look and say, well, you know, what did the motor carrier do to help him succeed? Because I, you know, I, I think more often than not, I find uh, even even with the so-called bad eggs in some of these big truck crashes, they'll even admit, man, oh, man, if someone just taught me the right thing to do, I would have done it. I just don't know, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, just like lawyers, I mean, there's good lawyers and there's bad lawyers. There's good truckers and bad truckers. And but the the, the bad thing, the, the bad news is that the bad ones kind of, you know, uh, make the rest of us look bad. Uh, when in fact, that's just not the case. And so same way with truckers. I mean, they're good and bad, good motor, motor carriers. There's bad motor carriers. Um, and But the, the fact that there are more good ones than bad ones don't excuse the bad ones. Right, right. The bad ones uh, seem to, even though they are the minority, they do seem to steal a lot of the limelight from the industry, you know? Yeah. Well, I know that you also, so part of what you do is some forensic work which for those folks that are listening that don't know what forensic work is, is that sometimes people that are in their field, they're, they're experts in their field, then they get called into litigation um, and end up being uh, testifying for either the victims, which is the plaintiffs, the people I represent, or sometimes on the defense, which is the trucking, the motor carrier, the trucking uh, industry, the insurance companies, whatever. Um, and I know, Adam, you do a little bit of work on both sides. Is that right? Yeah, our firm as a whole is probably is probably pretty close to 50-50, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, I think I do a little bit more plaintiff work, and my father, who's also an expert, probably does a little more defense work. We have other experts here that do what we do, too. Uh, they're probably pretty close to 50-50 themselves. Uh, it's just kind of the way the things shake out sometimes. We're not really selective with our cases. Um, I tell people this all the time. If, if you ring my phone, I'm going to give you – an objective, honest answer. Uh, and sometimes you might not like what I have to say. And so it, when that's the case, why would you hire me? It only makes sense. You know, why, why would you hire me if I, if I don't have something that you want that, that you like to hear, you know, but I, I never really change or manipulate what I say, depending on who I'm talking to. I just give you an honest answer. And, and if it's, if it's helpful for you, then I end up getting hired. And so sometimes the way things shake out, it's just, I get, especially with scheduling and everything else, I get a little bit more plaintiff work, but um, to, to me, it really doesn't matter who hires me. I feel like I'm, I'm really coming in, into a case to work for the jury and work for the judge. I'm really just there to help explain things the best I can. I'm not here to assign fault or decide the case for anybody. You know, I have, I have a very narrow window of, of uh, th that I'm looking through with a case and I'm, and I'm hoping really just to help to educate others like the jury and the judge. And so everyone can make an informed decision. Well, and I think that the good attorneys, the, the good trial attorneys, um, that's what they're looking for. Um, we don't want to hire a gun who always gives us the, a yes answer or who manipulates the data or manipulates the facts. The facts are what they are. And the right. best way to lose a trial is to try to try to manipulate those facts, at least from my experience. And so our right. job is to, you know, I look at my job is to make a decision. Do we have a case that, that has some merit? Um, should we go forward with it? If not, that's fine. I've spent thousands of dollars to find out that we didn't have a case. And I can tell you, my clients appreciated my honesty and dealing with that early on rather than dragging them through years of hell um, only to get the same result sometime later. On the other hand, I'll fight till hell freezes over if I have a case that my clients are in the right and they deserve to be compensated. And yeah. the best way to do that is to hire people like yourselves or your dad who are objective and who are going to just tell you, this is what you got. Right. Yeah. We all, you know, I'll, I'll dispel a myth, a myth too, about us as experts. 
I, I think in, there's a stereotype sometimes that, you know, uh, and I don't know this, this, you could tell me this, this, this stereotype might exist in your profession too, but sometimes there's this, this stereotype or this idea that if, if you ring my phone, the, uh, the juice starts ticking, you know? And so sometimes people feel like, uh, they, they don't, they don't want to talk to us unless, unless they absolutely have to, cause you know, we're going to charge them for our time. And to an extent that's true. We do charge for our time. Everyone has to make a living, but, uh, I tell everybody this dude, never hesitate to call me and just ask me what my initial opinion is on a thought. I'm not going to charge you for that time. I'm happy to give you my opinion. If you say, Hey, here, here's the case. Here's the facts. What do you think? I'm going to give you an honest answer. And if you don't hire, hire me, my feelings aren't hurt at all. And I think we're all better for it then. Yeah. Well, and I think I get frustrated with, you know, I, I I'm, I'm doing a project right now where we're doing focus groups and we're, we're working with experts to try to see, you know, uh, how to develop an area of the law. And, and so in, in the, you know, the, the thing is the expert came back and said, well, you know, how, how much money is reasonable? And I'm like, well, I mean, I really, I'm paying for your time. I mean, my time is worth something. Your time as an expert is worth something. And I really have problems with, with lawyers who aren't willing to invest in their clients or their case I mean, until later down, way down the road, when it may be too late um, to, 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 you know, if I talk to you early on, you'll tell me whether I have a case or I don't have a case. Then, but and beyond that, if you say, well, I think you might have a case, but we don't know yet, but here's what you need to know. And then you can educate me so that I can go find out the information that I need to give back to you so you can tell me whether I have a case or not. Yep. And, and I hate that when lawyers are stingy or they don't want to invest their money or they, maybe they don't have the money. Um, and they're not wanting to, whether it's you or an accident reconstructionist or a survey or whatever. Um, it's just, you know, these cases are too important to our clients to not involve you people like you in the very beginning. Yeah. There's a, there's, there's a, there's a big investment, especially with truck cases. You know, it could be a, it, it's a huge investment on, on your part. I really commend plaintiff attorneys, especially for, for the amount of, of emotion and time and, and your own hard earned dollars that you put into a case, investing in a case. And, but it, it is well worth it, man. You just can't, you can't cut corners with something like this. Cause it's so, it's so much more complicated than like a normal car crash. And, you know, that's, that's what it takes. You got to get, you got to get experts on board and you got to get people on your team that can help you really solve the puzzle. And I want to talk about that. I mean, I think there is a misconception in the public because, I mean, this podcast is designed for ordinary folks that have never gone through this type of situation before. And all of a sudden now they're faced with a loss of a loved one or a catastrophic injury from a semi-tractor trailer case. And they're looking at it saying, well, gosh, this is just another case. I'll just pick up the phone and, and call or Google or whatever and just call whoever. But you know as well as I do that a truck wreck is not a car wreck. Yeah, it's, it's a lot different. I mean, just a, a truck, it, you know, I, I truly believe this, and I, don't, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm exaggerating, but I really believe that a truck is as different from a car as a boat is from an airplane, okay? So just because you're a sailor doesn't mean you can fly a plane. And I truly believe that these are, these are that significantly different. Even something that seems so simple, you know, if we tried to make the two types of vehicles a uh, 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 large commercial truck and a car sound the same, I would probably say something like, well, they both have tires and a steering wheel and they both have a gas pedal and a brake pedal and they stop and go and they have taillights. But that's about, you know, that, that sort of thing is about as far as the similarities extend. The Even, even those simple tools, like the way our brakes work are completely different. You know, in, in cars, they brakes are, are hydraulic. In other words, there's uh, there's, there are lines with liquid running through them. When you hit the brake pedal, it squishes that liquid through the line and causes the brakes to apply in trucks. Our brakes are operated with air. So when you hit the brake pedal, it squishes air through a line to apply the brakes. And there are a lot of differences there. The, there's, there's something called brake lag time, which really practically doesn't exist in normal cars. So when I hit my brake pedal, there's a delay between when I hit the brake pedal and when the brakes start to apply. That can kind of throw you off. So now you have to kind of predict. You got to become Miss Cleo, you know, and kind of predict when you're going to stop before you even start hitting the brake pedal. And it's it's really squishy. So in a car, it's you know you can almost feel when you're when you're applying the brakes, and 
in a truck, that feeling isn't really there without a lot of experience and training because it's squishy. You're squishing air around. It'd be like grabbing a balloon and squishing it. The air, the air moves around. It doesn't really push back as hard. So uh, e even something as simple as the brakes are just so, so, so different. And there are different regulations that apply to us. There are different standards uh, that, that apply to us generally. Um, you know, in, in many ways, the standards are the same. We all have to drive our vehicle without crashing into things or having others crash into us. Uh, we all have to operate reasonably, but there are performance objectives for us as truck drivers that are totally different. I have to be in a random drug and alcohol pool. I have to be physically qualified. I have to go to uh, a, 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 a certain type of registered medical professional um, every for me right now, it's every two years. Some people it's even less. Uh, and I have to have, I have to take a physical and I have to have uh, my background checked by my employer in ways that other occupations just don't. And there are, there are a lot of really unique rules and qualifications that apply to truck drivers that don't apply to car drivers. I have to inspect my vehicle in ways that you don't. There's nothing saying that you as a car driver have to inspect your vehicle before you get in it in the morning. There's nothing that says you as a normal car driver has to inspect your vehicle and, and prepare a report at the end of the day uh, and submit that to someone. You're not exposed to the same kind of scrutiny and, and auditing process that the federal government puts us under. Uh, and all that's for very good reason, because it, it can be it can be a dangerous job. You know, but dangerous is kind of a subjective word, too. I don't you know, I, I don't I don't feel it's dangerous. My my father likes to use the example of the Walenda brothers and the Walenda family. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're sure. some of those famous tightrope walkers, you know, and and uh, you see someone like Nick Walenda tightrope walk, you know, a across a couple of skyscrapers on, on a piece of wire as thick as a nickel. Uh, that might look pretty dangerous and, and it probably is dangerous to the rest of us. But to someone like him that's been doing it since he was two years old, it's not dangerous at all. He's, he's trained. He's professional. He's, he's meant to do that, you know. Yeah. And for, for good truck drivers, it's the same thing. It's, this is it's not necessarily dangerous for us because we're, we're meant to do it, assuming that we're trained and, and educated properly and have the right attitude, you know. And, and I would agree with that. I mean, and obviously the number of hours you can drive are regulated by you for you. They're not for me. <clears throat> I can. I can drive as many days as I want, as many hours as I want in the car. And you don't have that same thing. And, and, but I see, I see lawyers, um, you know, um, I, and I get cases referred to me by other lawyers that, um, that don't know trucking and, and they, and they just assume that it's similar. It's negligence law, it's tort law. So that that's good enough. What, but what I find is that there's a certain level of knowledge, certain level of experience, and you have to have the resources to invest in these cases to be a successful truck wreck lawyer. Um, and, and, and when you see lawyers who aren't, it's pretty clear and pretty obvious the ones that, that, that and that's both on the plaintiff side and the defense side. Uh, I just ran up against a defense lawyer the other day who has no idea what the CDL manual stand is, is says. It has no, they have no idea that uh, what the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations say. They don't know what the, the um, industry standards are. They, they have no clue about any of that. Um, and so when they prepare their truck driver for a deposition, they're at a huge disadvantage. Um, and I see that on both sides. And I assume you probably see that. And, and how important is it for them? I mean, the average person listening to this, how important is it to have a lawyer that is familiar, that has that level of knowledge, experience and resources? Yeah, it's it's I mean, it's I, I really feel like and maybe no no fault of their own sometimes, but I really feel like if. If you're an attorney that doesn't specialize in this sort of thing or you don't surround yourself with the type of people that can help uh, educate you on this subject, you're really doing a disservice to your clients. And, and like you said, that is on both sides of the field. I have a I have a defense attorney that hires me pretty regularly. And the one thing uh, and, and I, mean, I don't mean this is any offense to him, but he doesn't know a lot about trucking. But the one thing that I'll give him a lot of credit for is he does have the the wherewithal to find people like me and let me help educate him and he's always willing to learn and he continues to get better and better and better because he takes the advice and he's he at least recognizes that holy cow this is another universe 
and I need to find people who know what they're talking about. And he does a, he does a great job with it. I think, you know, but uh, yeah, on both sides of the fence, you, you, you gotta, you gotta educate yourself and you gotta surround yourself with people who really know the trucking industry, you know? Yeah. And there's so many issues on just determining who might be responsible for a semi-tractor trailer wreck that you don't have in, in, in an auto case. I mean, you've got you've got all these different players. You've got the motor carrier, the driver, the broker, the shipper. Um, you know, sometimes it's in a construction zone. You may have a construction zone issues. You may have other parties that are that are, are in there. And then the insurance and who's insuring the trailer and the tractor, who's legally responsible for that load, um, is even if you know it, it's complicated uh, for lawyers who deal with it day in and day out, and that we have to rely on experts to help us sort through all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's even complicated to us that working in the industry, you know, I mean, as long all the way back to my grandparents uh, living in the industry and even, you know, the we probably I, I'll tell you, we 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 work hundreds. We, we receive hundreds of new cases every year, which is a lot. I don't know. I mean, you know, your average attorney might just have what, just a hand like four or five, just a few cases, some of them every year. Right. So we work hundreds and hundreds of new cases every year. And still, sometimes these issues are, yeah, extremely convoluted and complicated to us to, to try and hash out. And we have to work pretty hard with one another, um, even as being experts. You know, sometimes it can get very confusing how these relationships work. So, uh, yeah, it takes it takes a village. I, and I was just I had an attorney you know, recently. It was just like I was trying to explain, didn't understand what the MCS 90 was. And because, again, in auto cases, you don't have that, you right. know, and trying to explain that to him was like trying to teach him Spanish or a foreign language that they didn't know um, already. So, um, but there is a lot of areas. And I think that, you know, and then, and then bringing in the right team uh, again, we know if, if you've been handling truck cases, I've been handling semi cases for over 30 years. And so you kind of know, okay, who should I turn to on what kind of case? Um, and, you know, and, and most truck rec lawyers handle them all over the country. And so, you know, people all over the country, um, you know, who should we bring into this case? Who can help educate us? But more importantly, at the end of the day, who can educate a jury? Like you said earlier, mm. it's basically you're trying to you're doing this for the jury. How do I teach the jury these complicated issues? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, and um, that's, you know, honestly, that's probably the funnest part about, about my job, too. I think that the the least fun part about my job is probably uh, depositions, you know, <laughs> Cause uh, no, no one's there to, you know, I, no one's there to, there's strategies involved there. No one's really there to just, just learn <laughs> necessarily. Yeah. So that's not necessarily the, the funnest part about my job, but being in, being in the courtroom certainly is because there, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the, really the purpose of the jury to an extent, right. Is to, is there to learn. They have to, they're there to gather information and facts so as an educator myself, someone that still runs a trucking school, it, naturally that would also be the, the funnest part about consultant for the going to a courtroom and speaking to the jury and helping them, helping them learn. Can you give us an exa- example or idea? I mean, so obviously we know your background now and you do testify and you help both sides. So what type of cases are you typically brought in on um, to help uh, the lawyers figure out what happened? Uh, who's responsible, um, and then maybe educate a jury if it goes that far. Usually, it's uh, it. I would say at this point in my career, it's mostly high what I'll call high profile cases too. So it's it's usually real catastrophic injuries or fatalities, um, simply because there's a lot more invested in in those. There's a lot more at stake, and so I've I've been blessed to establish myself as someone who, who needs to kind of come in on those types of issues. Uh, and so usually if it's, a, if it's, a, I hate to use the word minor, but if it's a less severe truck crash where the, the responsibility on the truck driver directly is, is pretty clear, you, you might not necessarily need me as much. So usually the issues I see are, you know, are there other parties at, at, at play here? Are there other people that we need to be considering as the jury, when we assign responsibility to this issue. Uh, And it all starts with the motor carrier. So my job is really to come in and not to give you an example, like I see in the cases is a a, a pretty common issue in terms of truck crashes is like a rear end accident, right? A truck 
for whatever re reason, rear ends another car. Well, you don't need me to come in and evaluate a bunch of stuff and go, yep, truck driver definitely rear ended somebody. I mean, that's pretty obvious, but usually where you'll need me to come in is to look at it and go, yep, there's some very specific regulations in terms of, uh, hours of service and fatigue rules. And here's how the driver violated those rules. Uh, here's how a motor carrier is responsible for managing the driver. Here's some responsibilities they have in the ways they hire the driver and they fail to do that. Uh, here's some things that they have to do in terms of training, some requirements they make to the federal government. Here's some standards that we have on what it takes to train a driver and what the results of that usually are. So there's really, there's really cool information in the industry about, you know, if you, if you have the proper safety culture, you manage drivers properly and you train them properly, there's absolutely a reduction in crash risk. And so I come in and kind of assign some um, or, or help direct where to look for the jury when they're kind of assigning uh, some responsibility to those parties. And sometimes it gets even more complicated too when you start, like you said, including brokers and stuff like that. But usually the, the, the place where I become most helpful, I think is in determining how other parties uh, helped contribute to the actions of the driver. Cause you, you know, that, like I said, the actions of the driver, most of the time it's, it's, if it's not obvious, it's at least spelled out pretty well. In facts, we know it's a rear end collision or we know the driver did X, Y, or Z, but for me, the, the the movie really starts before you get to that frame. It starts well before the plaintiff and the defendant meet in in contact. So that's kind of what I what I do is I come in and help look at how those other parties are responsible. Yeah. And I think one of the cool things about what we do on the plaintiff side is that uh, we can uh, through what we do we can educate jurors, uh, we can educate insurance carriers, we can educate motor carriers. Um, as to um, what is right, what is the proper way of doing things. And we can actually have, have an impact on the industry. Uh, recently, I had a case where um, the, the semi driver uh, had sleep apnea, but was undiagnosed. Um, and uh, he drove nights and he was overweight. His neck was big. I mean, he had all the typical signs that you would have that you would look for. If you're, if you're a truck driver, if you're, a, if you're a motor carrier, you say, hey, this driver's gained a lot of weight. He has high blood pressure. He's older. He is, you know, he fits the profile of somebody that we ought to be watching and we got him driving nights. Um, and unfortunately, we allege that he fell asleep and he kills a bunch of people in a construction zone when he's driving, all of a sudden has to slow down or stop. He misses every sign. He has his truck on cruise control and he plows into the back of our, our care. And this, unfortunately, the motor carrier didn't have very good education uh, tools in place to help this driver know that, you know, you can have sleep apnea and still drive. You can just get treated and here are the, you know, here are the things you should do. And, um, and the cool thing about that case was we were right on the edge of trial and my client gave me authority and said, look, and this was a large motor carrier who I can't say the name, but they gave me permission to say, we'll take X number of dollars or we'll take less, significantly less, if you will agree to change your policies and put in writing these things so that you can educate other drivers so this never happens again. And this carrier said, well, you'd rather pay less and make the changes, as long as you don't tell everybody who we are so that it can't be used in other lawsuits. And my client didn't wanna, we're not trying to use it for other lawsuits. We were using it to make it safer because these semis for this company are driving all over the country. And so, but using people and saying, what, and people like yourself that say, Here's what the standard is. Here's what you should be doing. That helps us then change the policies of a company. Yeah, that's, I, I, I really commend you for doing that. I know there's a lot of plaintiff attorneys that do that too. And I think it's such a beautiful strategy because to me, it really, you know, the, the, you're proverbially putting your money where your mouth is uh, and really trying to take action. You're not, you know, I, I think it, I think it probably helps your industry too, David, because it, I, in my mind, it changes the stereotypical perception that people can have of lawyers sometimes. Uh, and we all know what those perceptions are, but I think when you, when you step forward and go, look, it's, I'm, I'm not here to bankrupt you. I'm here to make, make a change for, for the, for the country, for the world, make everybody safer. I think it really speaks volumes 
to you as an individual, but also the, your line of work and, and other attorneys like you that are trying to do the same thing. And uh, honestly, I feel like that's probably the only, that's probably the most effective way to make changes in the trucking industry is what you're doing, you know, and to anybody that needs historical examples of that, just look at other things in the automotive industry, like seat belts and airbags. I mean, usually you don't have automotive manufacturers coming forward and going, you know what, we should do this. It's going to cost us a lot of money and a lot of heartache, but we should do it for safety. That doesn't usually happen. You have to wait till there's lawsuits and then they go, all right, we need to have seatbelts in all of our cars. All right. Safe, you know, airbags need to become a standard. And I think we, the same thing is true for the trucking industry. What, you know, either by, by fault or, or by no fault of anyone necessarily, sometimes things are slow to change in the trucking industry or they'll never change in the trucking industry. But when you have people like you come forward and there are lawsuits and, and the, the public demands change, then that's when we start to really see things, you know, improve, I think. Yeah. Well, one of the cool things that you guys also do, which is uh, my firm participated in here recently, um, was through legacy. You guys actually educate um, legal professionals uh, on trucking. Um, and uh, I took a bunch of my lawyers, most of my lawyers out to Montana where you're at um, so that you could educate us on, on that. And I think that's really cool. And, and again, it's, you know, you look at the number of lawyers. I think there's less than 100 lawyers that are board certified in truck accident law. Um, my partner, Scott Follis, and I are both board certified. But you think about how many lawyers are in the country, how many personal injury lawyers there are. And there are very few of us that are board certified. Then you look at the number of lawyers. OK, here's the number of lawyers who actually have an interest in this. But then how many of us invest in our other lawyers in our office and, and have them educated? Um, and I think what you guys are doing is, is fantastic. Um, and I know my lawyers came back with a new appreciation, number one, about how hard it is to be a truck driver. Um, and by you having truck drivers there that these my people can interact with, they have a whole new respect for what is a good truck driver and how tough is this job. And, and so I commend you and your dad and your company for doing that. But maybe you can talk a little bit about about your, uh, your program. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, sometimes people call it the lawyer's course. I feel like that's kind of an unfair name because there are legal and administrative professionals that come. We had a class um, last month, I think, and like 18 of them were just paralegals or case managers. So it's not, it's not just lawyers, but the, the whole point of that particular course, yeah, is kind of speaking to legal and administrative professionals um, how to investigate crashes better, how to uh, look at your cases a little differently, make sure you're gathering the right facts and the right in information and putting the right people in your camp when you're when you're litigating these cases. So that's kind of the whole point of it. And I, I do think it is a lot of fun, too, because, you know, a, a large majority of the time that you're here, we're teaching you to drive trucks, too. And uh, probably my my favorite part about the course is to see everyone's perception of the trucking industry when, when at the end of the course, it's amazing to me how much more empathetic everyone is towards the trucking industry. And uh, it's, that, that's probably the, the best takeaway. You know, that's probably the best thing that, that I can do, especially in my mind, especially for plaintiff attorneys, because most of the, most of the time as a plaintiff attorney, your client is not, Sometimes they're truck drivers, but most of the time they're not. So the I think the the, the default position sometimes plaintiff attorneys and truck crashes can be you know attack attack mode. We're attacking this truck driver, this trucking company, and when I can help people like that feel a little more empathetic towards trucking companies and truck drivers, I feel like I've really done a great service to our industry and, and probably really helped them to fight the case better. You know, like maybe I sh shouldn't put so much emphasis on this one issue because truly it didn't matter or this wasn't where the focus of the crash was. It's, it's over here, you know? And so I, I always love at the end of the course, seeing all these attorneys go, Holy cow. I didn't realize, I didn't realize how tired, how, how difficult this really is. I didn't realize how tired I would be just from driving, you know, uh, just for driving for five hours, let alone 11 hours, which is what we're allowed to do as truck drivers, right. Or work a 14 hour day, which most be uh, the large majority of us don't work. 14 hour days yet somehow we're allowed to do it all day long. 
So it's, uh, it's really fun to be able to teach you guys how to drive trucks, but, and, but also show you a lot of the ins and outs of, of what motor carriers do and what truck drivers have to go through every day and just slowly watch your eyes open and, and kind of change your perspective of things. And I do. Yeah. I wish, I wish a lot more, I wish I had time to do the class every week <laughs> and I wish a lot more lawyers would certainly come through and do it themselves. I mean, there's, you know, I think last year, um, my, my dad and I were recently talking about some statistics with truck crashes. I think last year there was, we're creeping towards 6,000 fatal truck crashes in 2021, for example. So we're creeping towards the, the 6,000 mark, which is, I'd like to see it at zero. I tell, I tell people all the time, I'd like to, you know, I've, I almost have two work that I do, right? Cause it, it, in one, I'm, I'm attacking bad truck drivers and in another side of my work as a, as a school, I'm teaching uh, truck drivers how to be safe. So, uh, you know, my whole, my whole mission in life is to put one half of my business out of, out of business, <laughs> you know, hopefully uh, eventually everyone's taught to drive so well that there's no more deaths, but yeah, we're creeping towards 6,000 deaths. I mean, you could probably consider all those in some form or fashion to be a law suitable situation. Uh, even, even, uh, catastrophic injuries, you're starting to talk, well up into the six figures every year, hundreds of thousands of, of times where there's potentially a, a law situation. Uh, that's a lot of cases. And it's more than just a hundred of you board certified lawyers that are speaking to those. So, you know, where, where are all those lawyers and how do we continue to branch out both myself and organizations that you're part of too, I'm sure. How do we continue to branch out and educate those other lawyers and let them know you're not alone and this is a lot bigger than you think. And we need to we need to continue to learn and grow together on on both sides of the fence too. I, I do really appreciate when I see plaintiff and, and defense attorneys that are both honest and straightforward and both kind of want the same thing. You know, I I don't want to give defense attorneys a bad name either. There are a lot of them out there that are really good folks. They want change in the industry too. They want the roads safer too. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. It's a three day course. Um, there's a little bit of classroom training. Other than that, we're out in the trucks. We're driving trucks. We're teaching you how to secure loads. We're teaching you how to do inspections on trucks. Uh, we do some accident reconstruction stuff. Uh, you know, I I we we go out to our proving grounds and I take the trucks up to highway speed and slam on the brakes and and we leave. Tire, t- tire tracks, tire marks, uh, sometimes almost jackknife the truck and we're able to see that in action and measure things. And I think it's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I hope I hope more more come to it for sure. And I think that's, uh, I mean, just like we were talking about the difference in the brakes, um, you know, uh, that you have between a car and a semi. And so when, you know, I've never, prior to coming out to Montana with you, I never had driven a semi. So I certainly knew that. I've read that. I've had experts testify to that. But there's something about feeling the brakes, um, you know, breaking uh, the tractor and the trailer for yourself. There's something about backing it um, that, you know, you, you hear you can have experts tell you about it. But until you've backed a, a trailer, um, that's a completely different issue. And so I thought, you know, and then, you know, looking at the, the stopping distances, we, you know, you went out and you just, you stopped a, an SUV, and then you took a tractor with a trailer, and then you took a tractor and you stopped them. And it's just, I mean, to actually see it, um, you know, at least for me, I'm the type of learner that I learn better when I see things. Um, mm-hmm. And I appreciate things better when I see them rather than just reading them. And, uh, and I thought that was really cool. And you also taught things about conspicuity, which Again, I can read everything I want to read. I've had a lot of cases involving conspicuity. I've hired a lot of experts on conspicuity over the last 35 years. But to actually go out with you and your people and actually see it firsthand is a completely different situation. Yeah. Uh, and, and I commend you guys for that. And, and I hope more lawyers go through it. If any lawyers happen to be listening to this, I don't care if you're on the plaintiff or the defense side. Um, I think you ought to go out there because you, you, you get so much more knowledge from that and experience. And, and I'd say the thing I probably learned the most or the thing that had the most impact on me was when I actually rode with you to the proving grounds and we're out on a highway and we're actually out in traffic. And oh, my goodness, um, I would be on pins and needles trying to drive a semi in traffic because there's cars <laughs> zipping in, cutting in, cutting out. And, and that's what everybody talked about was how wore out you are 
from a, just for a short period of time that we drove the truck. Yeah. Yeah. It's exhausting. It's extremely fatiguing. I tell people that all the time that, you know, for, for better or worse, when you, when you go on a road trip in your car, maybe you listen to the radio or listen to a book on tape, or you're kind of enjoying the sights as you're driving. Uh, and I, I ask like, I ask people, how much of that are you really doing at your job? I mean, you can't, you can't go listen to a book on tape or listen to your favorite music while you're in the courtroom. Can you, David? And nope. for, for me, the truck, the driver's seat is my office. It's my courtroom. And I have a job to do. It's not just holding a steering wheel. And so it's, but it's oftentimes less physical and a lot more mental. It's extremely fatiguing because I'm constantly having to think and plan and prepare and visually search my environment. And I'm going to, I'm having to do a lot because it might take me, you know, four or five, 600 feet or more maneuver that might take you 80 feet in a car. So uh, I really have to be thinking ahead and having a lot of plans and backup plans is extremely complicated. And so, yeah, at the end of the day, you're beat, man, you're exhausted. It's very, very fatiguing. Well, um, Adam, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with us on this podcast. And I think for folks that aren't in the industry and even those people who are in the industry, uh, I know that they've learned something from today. Is there anything else any, anything else you want to add that you think is important uh, for victims or people out there who are um, dealing with a catastrophic uh, semi-tractor, 18-wheeler, big truck, dump truck, whatever, um, you know, that you think is important that they should know? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think the, probably the most important thing I could think of is that, you know, let's, let's all remember that we're, we're all humans. I don't think for the most part, any of us really want to hurt one another. And, and I hope that we can continue to learn and grow from one another, both people in the trucking industry and people outside of the trucking industry. And I, I would really encourage folks that don't work in the trucking industry to try and educate yourself more the same way that you did with your firm coming to my class and try to learn more about trucks uh, so that we can work together to, sh to share the road safely. Well, thanks again. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed talking to you. This is David Craig, and you've been listening to After the Crash. If you'd like more information about me or my law firm, please go to our website, ckflaw.com. Or if you'd like to talk to me, you can call 1-800-ASK-DAVID. If you would like a guide on what to do after a truck wreck, then pick up my book, Semi-Truck Wreck, A Guide for Victims and Their Families, which is available on Amazon, or you can download it for free on our website, ckflaw.com. 